So I guess it's uh, time to, to start. Uh, and uh, I am uh, delighted to introduce the 2013 recipient of the James Wilkinson Prize, Le Ching uh, Wing. The James Wilkinson Prize in American Analysis and Scientific Computing uh, was established in 1979 and is awarded for research in or other contributions to the American Analysis and Scientific Computing during the six years preceding the award. And the purpose of the prize is to stimulate early career contributors and to help them in their careers. Li Ching Wing is a professor um, at the Department of Mathematics and the Institute for Computational Mathematical Engineering at Stanford University. He has been awarded multiple uh, awards and fellowships, including the Sloan Fellowship in 2007, an NSF Career Award in 2009, and the Fan Kang Prize of Scientific Computing from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2011. The 2013 James Wilkinson Prize is awarded to Li Ching Wing. His research concerns uh, the design of fast and accurate numerical algorithms for fundamental problems in scientific computing, and it displays his exceptional skills as both mathematical analyst and computational scientist, combining ideas from approximation theory, probability, special functions theory, multi analysis, and parallel computing. He has made outstanding contributions in many areas, including the rapid ev evaluation of oscillatory integral transforms, high-frequency wave propagation, and the computation of electron structure in metallic systems. And the title of his lecture is Hierarchical Interpolative Factorization. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fonseca. So uh, I'm really honored to receive this award, and, uh, and I think that a lot of other young people equally deserve this award, and I feel very lucky. So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about the, my jo recent joint work with uh, my postdoc, Kenneth Ho, at Stanford University, and the title is Hierarchical Interpolated uh, Factorization. And so before I start, I'd like to thank a few people, and uh, there are a lot of names here. So first, I'd like to thank the people who have very strong influence on uh, the way I think about numerical analysis and scientific computation, and who taught me a lot of things. As, uh, uh, Dennis Zorin is my uh, PhD advisor. Emmanuel Kenneth was uh, supervised by postdoc. Uh, uh, and also, uh, Leslie Greengarden and Vladimir Rocklin have been very influential in de developing efficient algorithm uh, for integral equations, and also, um, uh, the scientific computing in general, and uh, my colleague Bjorn Quist, uh, previous poly colleague Bjorn Quist at the, uh, UT Austin, with a lot of interesting work together. And I also like to thank uh, uh, my collaborators, and, uh, especially Laurent de Monet. Uh, we did a lot of work together. It has been a lot of fun, and certainly we should continue that. And also Ling Ling and Jian Feng Lu and uh, George Biros, uh, and was also uh, I learned a lot from them. And finally, I would like to thank all my students, postdocs, previous students, postdocs, and current students and postdocs. Many of the things I, you know, our papers is, is essentially done by them, and many of the ideas I came from them. So um, I really, I'm, I really enjoy the experience working with them. So the problem that I'm going to talk about is a very uh, classical kind of problem. It's uh, let's consider elliptic problems, uh, both in the PDE formulation and also integral formulation. So the first is the PDE formulation. I didn't write explicitly what the domain is and a boundary condition, but just you can think about it as uh, literally zero boundary condition on uh, a uh, cube, for example. And second kind of problem is, uh, I mean, the integral formulation of this, uh, these elliptic problems. For example, suppose you have a Laplace equation on a certain domain, you can transform this integral representation and solve the integral equation instead. So I typically assume that all these equations are discretized, discretized by local basis functions like finite difference method, finite element methods, and uh, for example, Nistrom discretization, uh, collocation discretization. Uh, I need them to be local in order to, uh, for most of the things uh, I'm going to say to make sense. Okay. So the main goal of this approach, this, this project, is try to develop a fast and also accurate algorithm for these discrete operators. What I want to do with these uh, uh, discrete operators, I want to be able to apply them efficiently, especially in the case of integral equations. Usually these are uh, dense matrices, and applying dense matrices to a vector can be quite expensive if the matrices are large. And I also want to be able to solve these systems, these, uh, these PDEs and, and also integral equations efficiently. 
And in some cases, it's very difficult to get the exact solution in one step. So in many cases, I want to build pre good preconditioners for iterative solvers. So these are the things I want to do with this, um, these two equations. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the notations here. So uh, I use capital letter A, B, C, P, Q to denote matrices. So I, J, K are the indices, stand for the degree of freedoms of these matrices. And uh, A, I, J stand for matrix entries. And P, Q, R, these letters stand for the set of indices, or set of degree of freedoms. And I use a MATLAB notation, A, P, Q, A, dot P, A, uh, sorry, this should be dot Q to stand for some matrices, restricted to these index sets, okay? So, um, I'm going to use some tools which, uh, for those people working in numerical linear algebra, and these have become quite standard tools and most people know them, but I just want to go through some, it's, but, but not necessarily the scalarization, but, but I want to go through these tools first to set the background, okay? So the first tool is a uh, true complement. Well, what, what, so let's consider matrix A, which is a SPD matrix, a metric positive definite matrix, and define our degree of freedom which can be partitioned into three sets, P and Q and R, they are disjoint. And we also assume that A, P, Q is equal to zero. So if you take a look at this matrix A, it's a three by three matrix, where these two entries, A, P, Q and A, Q, uh, sorry, A, Q, A, P, Q and A, Q, P are zero. What the true complement does is very simple. It essentially introduces these two matrices, uh, one for the set P and one for the set Q. What it essentially does is does elementary row and elementary kernel operations to uh, set some of the matrix entries to be zero. So what it does is that if you multiply this AP and AQ matrix, it transpose on the left-hand side of A and multiply AP and AQ on the right-hand uh, right side of A, you see that these entries here, uh, these two uh, sub matrices here, uh, which correspond to the interaction between P and Q to R, and also the interaction between R to P and Q are set to be zero, okay? And this is essentially the steps that we do in Gauss elimination or the steps we do LDL factorization. And this uh, bottom right matrix AR will be modified, but the good thing is that we have a lot of zeros in this matrix now, and this makes things much easier. And especially when trying to solve a linear system in this, for this new matrix, you see that P and Q are totally decoupled from the degree of freedom R, so we can treat them totally separately. So uh, the second, okay, so uh, all right, so this is the simplest case where we only have two degree sets, P and Q, that we want to decouple. So in the talk that I'm going to give, uh, so, so in, the, in the following slides, so in many cases we're going to uh, work with a disjoint uh, collection, uh, a collection of disjoint in this sets. So not only we have just two P and Q, we have many of them, we denote typically denote them by C, and we require that ACC prime to be equal to zero for any C and C prime, different, uh, different members of this uh, disjoint collection. And for, for each of the C, we can uh, carry out this true complement ca calculation. And at the end, we'll have this matrix, which we denoted by W transpose AW, and where W is essentially the product of the S matrices that I introduced earlier here, okay? And if we carry out this calculation, at the end, if you take a look at this matrix, W transpose AW, and all the members, all the degree of freedoms in C will be decoupled from the rest of the degree of freedoms. Now the second term I'm going to use is called interpretive decomposition, and this concerns, uh, typically concerns with matrices which is numerical lower rank. Okay? So let B be a matrix which is numerical lower rank, typically it's a sum matrix of a bigger matrix, and because the, numer the matrix is lower rank, we know that the matrix essentially can be represented as a linear combination of a few of its columns and a few of its rows. So what mathematically this means that is that we can partition the column set into two subsets. So Q stands for the column set. It becomes the union of two subsets. One is called Q check and the other is Q hat. So Q check are the skeleton columns, which are these columns that you use in writing, uh, in, in, this linear, uh, in this linear combination. And the redundant columns are the ones that can be represented by the skeleton columns. And similarly, we can partition the rows into the P check and P hat, where P check is the skeleton called rows that we use in this um, uh, low rank representation, and P hat is the, the, the rows that can be represented by the, uh, can be written as a linear combination of the skeleton rows. If we do that, then this B numerical low rank matrices, we can be, can be write down as a two by two block matrices form, where this is corresponding to the redundant rows skeleton rows, redundant columns, and skeleton columns can be written as a, this uh, product of these three matrices. The matrix in the middle is actually corresponding to this skeleton, the restriction of the original matrix in the skeleton rows and skeleton columns, and multiplied by a certain weighting matrix on the left-hand side and a weighting matrix on the right-hand side. So the good thing about this is that the interpretive composition itself brings sparsity here. So what do I mean by that? 
Well, essentially, given these T and Q matrices here, what we can do is that we can modify a slightly different matrix, which is 1 minus TP transpose identity on the left-hand side, and, and it's the transpose for the Q matrix on the right-hand side. And if you take out this product and use this approximation of BPQ, you see that all these entries, these three entries of Bs become zero. And the only, entry, the only non-zero entries of the B that, the only members of B that survive is actually the, uh, the members of B corresponding to the skeleton rows and skeleton columns. Okay? So essentially what this says is that by doing some elementary row and elementary column operation, which can be easily defined through these weight matrices T's, we'll be able to zero out many entries in B. How this cannot help us? Because by combining the skeleton, uh, this, this brings down to the skeletonization techniques. What this says is that, well, if you take a look at this matrix, uh, given any SPD matrix, let's say, and uh, let's, put, let's assume that it's defined on the uh, two, a union of two degree freedom sets, P and Q, and we also assume that the, the off-diagonal blocks, APQ and AQP, uh, numerical low rank. So because the numerical low rank, we can use this uh, uh, interpretive decomposition technique I talked about in the previous slides to write these off-diagonal blocks into these forms. Now, if you allow me to introduce this QP matrix, Q, uh, QP matrix and QQ matrix, what are these matrices? These are essentially the matrices uh, that I use here. But I have to, I mean, extend the dimension so that they, each of them will only work, uh, one of them will work on the P degree freedoms, one will work on the Q degree freedoms. The reason I'm doing that is the following, is that suppose now because P and Q are separated into P check, P hat, Q check, Q hat, these are the uh, redundant P and members in P, skeleton members in P, redundant members in Q, skeleton members in Q. So now I can write this A matrix into a four by four matrix form, okay? Now if you, this, where the top, uh, this, these two by two corresponding to PP interactions, this is corresponding to QQ interactions, this is PQ and QP. Now, because these two of the diagonal blocks are low rank, if I apply these Q matrices I just introduced, the transpose on the left-hand side and, P and Q matrix on the right-hand side, as I did earlier in this interpolated decomposition, you see that, uh, well, this matrix, only the bottom right block survives. So for these off diagonal blocks in this A matrix, only this red uh, small block survives. Everything else becomes zero, okay? This is good because we start with the possibly dense matrices and now many of them, many of the entries become zero. Well, that's not the end of the story because if you take a look at the, the top left part, this corresponds to the P check degree freedom. But now if you take a look at the rows here, this P check is only interacted with P hat, which is the skeleton uh, uh, degree freedoms in P, and the rest are zero. So therefore I can use a shoe complement for P's and similar for Q to generate more zeros. So I remember the S matrices are corresponding to the shoe complement matrix and the matrix using shoe complement calculation. So if you apply this S matrices transpose on the left and S matrices on the right hand side, you will be able to zero up, kill this entry here, this entry here, and similar this and this entry here. So you get the matrix at this end. This matrix is very nice because it has a lot of zeros. You transform a dense system, more or less dense system, into a sparse system. Now if you take, we call this final matrix called ZA. So if you take a look at this matrix ZA here, well, the blue degree freedom is this corresponding to P check, the redundant entries in P, and this is Q check, redundant entries in Q. They're not interacting with anywhere else. So therefore, for them, they appear totally decoupled from the rest of the degree freedom. This is what I wrote down here. P check and Q check are decoupled from the rest of the degree freedom. So when I talk about use it as a preconditioner, solving a linear system, apply it, they can be treated totally differently. So all I need to do is that to work on this two by two dense system instead of the start with the, uh, I start with the four by four dense system. Okay. So again, this is only the simple case to illustrate what happens when you have two degree freedom sets, P, uh, two sets of degree freedoms when the P and Q. But if you have a multiple uh, sets of degree freedoms that are disjoint, I typically denote them as a collection of sets C, and I can repeat these techniques for each of the members, lowercase C in this capital case C. And so, by, and you see that for, for each P and Q, I have uh, one capital Q matrix and one capital S matrices. So therefore, if I repeat it over every member of this collection, I will have the product of the Q matrices, one for each C, and the collection, a product of the collection of S matrices, one for each C as well. So, and so, 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 so using this notation, I can write my result, uh, final result for this uh, skeletonization technique as ZA as a product of the U transpose times A times U, okay? So at the end product is that the redundant entries of this every degree freedom set C will be decoupled from the rest of the degree freedom. Okay. Right. Okay. So these are the uh, 
three main tools that uh, uh, we're going to use in, in for the rest of the talk. So let's go back to the differential equations here. So, so for, to simplify, we're going to consider this differential second order dif differential equations uh, defined on the cube. Just to well, it, it, the method itself will work for general geometry, but let's just uh, start from the cube to, to make things simple and with zero di Dirichlet boundary condition. So has been this is a very classical problem. There have been a lot of work done in this direction. So first is the, the first kind of solve, the, 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 the most natural method to solve these kind of system is use the direct methods where uh, has been around for many, many years. And uh, probably the most, use, most efficient method in the uh, uh, direct methods are nested dissection methods or multifrontal methods, starting from the work by uh, George and Ian Duff. And, uh, uh, and the complexity of these methods are fairly efficient for two dimensional problems. For three dimensional problems can be pretty high. The reason is that if you take a look at the, the so called front in this uh, netted dissection multifrontal methods, it can be get pretty large for three dimensional problems. And that becomes uh, one of the bottleneck for solving these, uh, for solving the elliptic problems in 3D using direct methods. So well, when direct method become too expensive, then people naturally turn to iterative methods. And iterative method like a preconditioned country gradient also, uh, algebraic motive grid also works fairly efficiently for many cases. But when the problem appears when you have the coefficient of this elliptic problem, A and B here has high contrast and has uh, rough coefficients, and then some of these methods do not work very well, and many methods need uh, tuning, which is, which is pretty specific to the problems. So another class of methods which is targeted for uh, uh, this, this equation is so-called edge matrices methods developed by Hackbush and his colleagues in Germany. And these methods have optimal complexity, meaning that if you work with a matrix with n degree freedoms, and these methods typically finish in n log n and square log n degree uh, number of steps. So this is very efficient methods in theory, but in practice, some of the prefactors and constants of these methods are pretty large. Okay. So more recently, there's uh, uh, the, 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 the several groups in, 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 uh, has been working on combining the ideas of the direct solver, like nested dissection, with the hierarchical matrices. So the essential idea is that we're going to still use nested dissection multifrontal methods, um, uh, the, the structure of nested dissection method and the multifrontal methods. But for the frontal matrices appearing in these methods, we're going to use hierarchical matrices or the so-called HSS matrices to speed up the calculation. So we have seen several sessions in this, in, in the, in this annual meeting, uh, 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 many talks on these topics, and that becomes quite popular. And the main people working this group in, uh, in this direction are Jin Lin Xia from Purdue, uh, Mingu from Berkeley, Martinson, uh, Gunnar Martinson from Colorado, and uh, there are many other people working on that. Okay? So in this class of methods, the constant is improved, but still quite large in many cases. So what we're going to do is that we're going to introduce some methods which we call hierarchical uh, interpolated factorization, which is based on top of the nested dissection methods. But instead of having a large front, we will use scalarization to make the front keep the front to a reasonable size. Okay. So to explain our methods, uh, what I need to do is I need to go through the nested dissection method very quickly. Okay. So suppose we have an elliptic problem defined on this rectangular domain. It's a square. And we're using, for example, finite difference, a five-point stencil to discretize this, for example, Laplacian operator. So these red dots are corresponding to the degree of freedoms, and every degree of freedom is interacting only with its neighbors. Okay. So the main idea of nested dissection method is says I'm going to partition this whole domain into 16 cells, and for each of the cells, it has some interior degree of freedom and some degree of freedom live on the boundary. Because every degree of freedom is only talking to a neighbor, so anything inside the cell will not talk to any other things inside the cell. It's only going to talk through the boundary. So therefore, what we can do is that we can use shoe complement to eliminate the degree of freedoms in the interior of these cells. Because they only talk to things with the boundary, so therefore, in the shoe complement operation, all the calculation will involve these degree of freedoms. Um, for example, this cell will only involve the degree of freedom on the interface, will not involve anything else. Okay. So here what I showed is a, 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 a schematically show the result of the uh, shoe complement. So this is my domain, this is not my matrix. And you see that all the red dots uh, inside the cell has been eliminated, they decoupled. So I'm not going to show them uh, on, on the figure on the right. So I'm, in the figure on the right, I only show the degree of freedom has yet to be decoupled. So these degree of freedom are still coupled together. Okay. Now, so the next step of the dissect section is very simple, is that instead of working with 4 by 4 uh, 16 cells, what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge four nearby cells together, and I get these bigger squares. Now, suddenly you see that the, these degree freedom used to be on the boundary now become the interior of my cell, so I can use the shoe complement to eliminate them again. I get this result, and I keep going, and um, there's one, one more level here, so I will have the, all the degree freedom inside the, the whole cell, uh, the whole domain, and then 
I can do an inversion or, or uh, like Cholesky factorizations to to decouple the, well, to to handle this degree of freedom. So the important thing, so so I use the word front here. So in the multi-frontal method and nested dissection methods, this is typically the front, and you see that the size of the front grows linearly with the side of the problem, right? The, the dimension, the number of degree freedom in each dimension. So therefore, if I have a two-dimensional problem with n degree freedom, so square root by square root of n uh, degree freedom each direction, the front grows like a square root of n. So I'm not going to be able to go into the details of the nested dissection methods, but I hopefully I'll give you an idea about how this works. Uh, it turns out that the complexity of the nested dissection methods is decided by the size of the front. So as I said, the front is proportional to the number of degree of freedom you have in every dimension, so therefore in this case it's square root of n. And the memory cost of the 2D nested dissection is linear in n. However, the factorization cost, the construction of the whole factorization of the nest dissection is slightly higher as n to the power 1.5, and the solved cost is n log n. So it's close to linear, but it's not exactly there. So the question is that, well, how do we be more, become more efficient? We see that the problem comes from the front size, because the front it gets larger and larger when n gets larger. So one way to solve this problem, and this is the way that we, we took, is that try to apply the scalarization ideas to keep the front always to a manageable size. Okay. So the idea, the, so the algorithm goes the following. So our framework we call a hierarchical interpolate factorization. So it goes as follows. So in the first level, it's exactly the zeros level. It's, it's level zero. It's exactly the same. We start from these cells. We eliminate the interior degree of freedom, okay, and we get the, the rest of the degree of freedom live on these uh, interfaces. So instead of just combining four nearby cells together immediately, what do what we do is, uh, is the following step: is that we still stick to this level, stick to the same geometric partition. However, if you take a look at each of these edges on this level, each edge contains seven points. Okay? So what we're going to do is that it turns out that due to the locality of this uh, differential operator, the degree of freedom on this edge is only interacted with the degree of freedom of the edge of the two nearby cells. And it turns out that this is a low rank interaction. So what we do next is that we apply this skeletalization ideas to decimate some of the degree of freedoms on every edge. So for example, if you take a look at the edge, you start with seven points in the interior. After this skeletalization, three intermediate in middle points are gone. There's only four points left. So we reduce the front size by a factor of two, roughly. Okay, so this is what I said here. We skeletalize interior degree of freedoms for each of the edge to keep the front size to be small. So now, after I perform the scalarization, I get this matrix ZA, uh, using my notation I introduced for the scalarization technique, is the product of this matrix come from the scalarization for the edges times the matrix come from the shoe company in the previous step times my original matrix and times their transposes. Okay. Now we are ready to combine these four cells together. Now you see that at this level, when I combine these four cells together, so I don't have the whole cross in the interior of the cell anymore. I only have part of the cross, which is close to the center. Then I can apply the shoe complement idea to eliminate all these interior degree of freedom. I get this picture here. Now, from here, I do not directly combine the four cells together to get the whole cell. What do I do? I take a look at each of the edges. Okay. I take a look at each of these edges here, and I do a scalarization again. When I do the scalarization, you can see that these red degree of freedoms in the middle of the edge, they disappear. They are decoupled from the whole system. The only thing survive is the degree of freedom that close to the corners of these cells. So now I go to the final step. And on the final step, only the degree of freedom that are really close to the center are the one that survives to that level. So you, when you compare with, com compare with the picture of these 2D nested dissection, uh, the front is a whole cross in the middle of the domain. But now, the front is only very small. It's only a little bit close to the center of the problem, the center of the whole domain. Now, the, what is the main idea here? The main idea here is that we alternate between the shoe complement for the cells and the scalarization for the edges to reduce the front size, to always keep the front size to be a pretty small number. So at the end, we have this factorization for what 2D problem. And you see that because each of these elementary row or column operations, we can essentially invert them or transpose of them fairly easily, and this will allow us to give a factorization of the inverse of the matrix. Now, when the approximation is accurate, this can be used as a direct solver. When the approximation itself is not accurate, this can be a good preconditioner. And as you will see that the front size is much smaller now. It used to be square root of n, but now it's order n. And the memory factorization cost and solve cost are all linear. Well, this is a 2D example. I'm going to go over this very quickly. You see that every time we increase the degree of freedom by a factor of four, and now if you take the memory cost, 
the factorization time and also the running time, it's all roughly multiplied by factor of four, so it's a linear algorithm. And also you see that uh, for the targeted accuracy, uh, both the solve and also the application um, give you roughly this, the accuracy that we desire. Where, and if you're not happy with this accuracy, if you really want to have 10 to minus 16, the floating point accuracy, uh, uh, actually floating point representation accuracy, you can embed it into a iterative solver and it converges very rapidly. So I'm gonna quickly go through the 3D example. So 3D here is that you have all the degree of freedom. The 3D nested dissection is gonna again do the same thing, which uh, you, you partition into different cells and then merge cells and do shoe complement. And this will be the front, uh, the, the final front of the nested dissection algorithm. You'll see that degree of freedom live on the faces. Now you know, when you technique, uh, this is a hierarchical uh, interpolative factorization. So instead of directly merged cells, what we're going to do is that we're going to apply interpolative composition, uh, the scalarization to each of these faces on all the levels. So you see that we have more levels, but on the other hand, the front is always much smaller. So in the 3D case, what we can show is that the front size, and in the nested dissection, the front size is n to the power 2 over 3. But in this case, using our new technique, the front size is n to the power 1 over 3. So it's much smaller. And similarly, the, to the 2D case, the member cost is linear, the factorization cost it turned out to be n log n, slightly higher than linear, but it's much better than n square cost of the standard nested dissection method. And also the solve cost is also linear. So this is a 3D example, and you, again you see that every time we double the degree of freedom roughly by a factor of eight, and also the memory cost, the factorization cost, and also the running time cost also increase by a factor of, of eight to 10. So I'm gonna quickly go over the integral equations. So again, there are iterative solvers, hierarchical matrix techniques, and all this, the recent leaders uh, work, again, um, Gunnar is one of the leaders in this direction, is using combined idea of a direct solver with something called recursive scalarization to solve these problems. So uh, what is, so our method itself, which again we call hierarchical interpolative uh, factorization, is similar to this direct solver, uh, this D, what I call DSRS method. But on the other hand, it's also used some other uh, new techniques to reduce the so-called frontal skeleton size. So let me go through this DSRS very quickly. So the idea of the DSRS is the following. Again, you partition the domain into, six, let's say, 16 cells. For each of the cells, Instead of doing the shoe complement to eliminate the degree of freedom, for integral equations you cannot do that. The reason is that it is a dense system, so every degree of freedom is interact with every degree of freedom. So instead you should use something which is called, uh, what, we talk, what I talk about called scalarization, to try to eliminate the degree of freedoms as much as possible, and you see that the remaining degree of freedom to live on the edges. So, and in DSRS what you do is that you again immediately combine the cells together, four cells together into one big cell and keep doing this recursive scalarization one step after another, try to, try to decimate as many degree of freedom you can from the system. And at the end, w what you end up with is a skeleton, again similar to this uh, multi, -front, multi -front and nest dissection method is to live on the center of the domain. Again, the, 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 the main problem in terms of computational complexity point of view is that what is the size of the skeleton? It's roughly like the number of degree of freedom on every dimension. So that's give you, that, that does, that's a problem uh, that, 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 that prevents you from having linear complexity. So the way we do that is ask ourselves the question, uh, so this is a list of the complexity of this method is that for the DS2RS method is that the factorization cost is n to the power 1.5. So the question we ask ourselves is that how can we reduce the size of or control the size of the skeleton? Well, the idea is that if you see from the previous picture, all the skeleton essentially live on the boundary of the domain. So therefore, in order to make sure that you can control the skeleton of the, uh, uh, the size of the skeleton, you need to move this skeleton to, the, uh, to these degree of freedom on the skeleton to the center of the cells. However, the skeletons are where they are, so I mean, I, I can't move them, right? Their degree of freedom come from my discretization. So the only way you can do that is to change the cells. So this is the main idea here. So I'm gonna go, to go over this fairly quickly. So again, the first step is exactly the same. We use a scalarization to decimate most of the degree of freedom in the interior and only keep the degree of freedom on the boundary. And the next step, instead of direct combining four cells together, what we do is that we rotate our, all the uh, partition by 45 degrees. So essentially, we take all the edges from the previous level and use the center of the edges to do a Volnern diagram partitioning. And now you see that many of the degree of freedom actually stay in the interior of the cell instead of the boundary of the cell. So what I can do now is that I can do a scalarization to decimate many of the degree of freedom in the middle of the cells. For example, if you take a look at this cell, you used to have this five to four degree of freedom here, but after you do the decimation, only two survive. Most of them are gone. 
So now I'll be able to control the skeleton size. So I'm going to rotate it back to my Cartesian partitioning, merge all these four big cells together, and do the skeletonization. And you see that most of the interior degree freedom are gone. What I do next is that pick the centers of these edges and do a Voronoi diagram partitioning. And then I will have these four by four cells. And you see that most of the degree freedom are in the center of the cell now. And if I do the skeletonization, they will be gone. Okay? So this is the main idea. I did do these two hierarchy of uh, hierarchical partitions in order to make sure that my skeleton size is in control. So I'm going to just quickly show you a 2D example. So uh, what I want to show you here is that the skeleton size is under control and the complexity is linear. And this is a 2D example. You see that every time we increase the degree, this is for the first kind of integral equation, every time we increase degree freedom by a factor 4, the cost, the memory roughly increased by a factor 4. For the 3D case, we do exactly the same, but instead of doing the cell centers and edge centers, we do cell and edge and the face. We have three layers of hierarchy to control the skeleton size. And this is a one 3D example, which is a actually on a sphere, it's a boundary integral equation example. You see that because it's on a sphere, so every time you refine the degree freedom multiply factor of four, and you see that the running time and memory cost every time increase roughly by factor of four. And this is the final X3D in the example. You see that for low accuracy, every time we increase the degree of freedom by a factor of eight, all the cost roughly increase by a factor of eight. For high accuracies, I mean, we think that the number is slightly worse. We think that we are not at the asymptotic regime yet. So finally, this is the conclusion. I talked about this new hierarchical interpolative factorization techniques for solving elliptic problem uh, in, those, in the differential equation setting and integral equation setting. So essentially, they combine ideas from shoe complement and skeletonization to make sure that the front size and the skeleton size to be under control to have linear complexity. So uh, in some sense, you can view this as the basis of the change methods, like the wavelet kind of methods. It's similar, but we compute all these basis change on the fly. And also, you can view this as a multi-grid method because we do decimal degree freedom at every level. So, but it's the, compared to the standard uh, multi-grid methods, these were prolongation restriction operator are pre-computed, but in our case, we compute all these operators on the fly. So these are just different views for these methods. So I'm, I think I'm a little bit over time, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, okay. so thank you, Li Qing. So uh, we have time for a couple of questions. I don't think there are any, so, oh, yes, it's just one there. Yep. Yes. Can you, can you come? Okay. Assuming you have a sequence of Helmholtz problems, high frequency Helmholtz problems, and, uh, and high frequency, okay. Helmholtz, Helmholtz, yeah. yes. And, uh, and for example, you always you increase number of grid points, you always keep fixed number of points per wavelength. Will you get a linear scalability? Uh, so, so first, I mean, th thank you for the question. This method does not really apply to high-frequency Helmholtz problem because we need this skeleton size to under control. We need these off-diagonal blocks to be low rank. For high-frequency problem, they are not low rank. So this method does not apply. And come back to the other question is that number of points per uh, wavelength. Uh, you can apply spectral element kind of techniques so that for those kind of methods, for spectral element methods, the pollution error grows pretty slowly. So, and these methods can be applied in the low frequency setting. Okay, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? So, I think uh, we just thank Leching Wing again. Thank you.